The real estate industry is the world's single largest contributor to climate change. At Fifth Wall, we're on a mission to help the industry eradicate its carbon emissions and build to zero. Well, Miles, thank you so much for joining. Where are you coming in from today? Oh, just the basement of our house in Oxford. Nice, nice. Can you just walk us through maybe the arc of your career and that interest? Yeah, well, all the way back in 1992, uh, the world committed to stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. That was the sort of words of the 1992 Rio Convention. And so I spent probably the first 15 years of my career, along with many in my community, on the problem of, well, what was that stabilization level? And that turned out to be a really hard question because ugh, we could wander off into details, but it's just incredibly difficult to pin down how much warming to expect if you fix concentrations of carbon dioxide at some level and, and hold it there indefinitely. So in the late 2000s, a few of us started to ask ourselves, was there another way of thinking about the problem? And one result that emerged, a really sort of strikingly simplifying result, was that every tonne of carbon dioxide we dump in the atmosphere drives up global temperatures by about the same amount as the previous tonne, and it, temperatures remain high essentially indefinitely. So carbon dioxide has this sort of ratchet effect. The more you put into the atmosphere, the warmer it gets. And the only way to stop the warming is to stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Until that time, people were arguing about, you know, should we be aimed for 50%? Should we aim for 80%? And then whose emissions should be in that 20%? You know, that, that's always the problem. If you say we've got to reduce emissions by 80%, then every company thinks, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll have that 20%, not a problem. Um, and... And, but what, of course, came out of this research was that, no, it's zero. You've got to get to net zero, which means we've just got to stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere. That sort of, I think a lot of people found that very helpful because it was such a, a simplifying step. And it, it's been embraced. It was taken up by the Paris Agreement. So it was you know, accepted by the world's governments in 2015, which, by the way, I think was a remarkable achievement of diplomacy for a new piece of science to come out in 2009 and then to be accepted in an international agreement only six years later. I think that that's phenomenal, actually, by the standards of international agreements. So I think we should give them absolute credit for that. And of course, since then, companies have stepped up. You know, mo Many, many companies now have set themselves uh, net zero targets. You know, companies accept They've got to play their part in this. And this is the, the framing that people are now using. That, that Everybody's aiming for net zero. Of course, the difficulty is not everybody knows exactly how to get there. Today, you know, one of the things that obviously we focus a lot on is the real estate industry's imperative to get to net zero. And candidly, I think the real estate industry is also concerned about what is effectively local carbon pricing in the form of these, you know, carbon neutrality laws and local law, local law 97 in New York. You have a very unique perspective on carbon pricing. Can you walk through how your very elegant conclusion intersects with a concept like carbon pricing? Economists love it because it's a very efficient way of bearing down on an activity that's causing some harm. It's you, you, instead of just letting people freeload by you know allowing them to do whatever it is they're doing that's causing harm, you make them pay for it, and then they think a bit more carefully about how much they do. So that, that all makes sense. If what you want to do is make people do less of something. But what is not clear to me is how you can use pricing alone. And by the way, this is now generally accepted by economists. We can't use pricing alone to get us to net zero because there are certain uses of fossil carbon that are so valuable. You know, how much, what, what sort of level of carbon price would stop you putting fuel into your rescue helicopters when there's a flood? I mean, it, it, it'd have to be pretty high. In, in order to get to net zero, zero, we see carbon prices going up to literally thousands of dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide, which, um, you know, uh, translates in, in more familiar terms to I think it's sort of up in the sort of tens of dollars per gallon of gasoline. So it's, it's, it's a sort of huge amount, Ebony. way beyond what anybody can ever imagine. These very, very high carbon prices would only emerge if we fail to invest in the alternative which is safe disposal of carbon dioxide rather than dumping it into the atmosphere. 
so the, the crucial economic insight is that generating carbon dioxide is in some cases a tremendously economically productive thing to do. In other cases, it's not. And the vast majority, in fact, of the carbon dioxide we generate at the moment is pretty unproductive. I mean, you don't need to drive a Hummer to get to work. The real estate industry is, industry is definitely one in which there's a lot of relatively unproductive carbon and including a price or putting a price on carbon would help weed out some of that unproductive carbon. But I think we also need to be realistic that it's not gonna get us to net zero. Net zero means every ton of carbon dioxide generated by continued use of fossil fuels needs to be safely and permanently disposed of not dumped in the atmosphere. That's what net zero has to mean. How do you think the real estate industry should then therefore be thinking about, look, I have all this operational carbon um, that I can't really get rid of in, in my assets, at least today. Sure, I, I buy offsets today, but do you think material solutions that are sequestering of CO2 are the real gateway that the real estate industry should be looking to and investing? In? Yes, I think the real estate industry should be screaming very, very loudly for sequestration to be developed much, much faster than it's happening at the moment. To, to achieve net zero, to stop climate change, we need to be reburying one ton of carbon dioxide for every ton generated by continued use of fossil fuels by mid-century. And at the moment, globally, we get rid of about 0.1%. So we have a we've already committed, apparently, to increase that fraction a thousandfold over the next 30 years. Right. It's not even going up at all. It's flat. And and now, what is that, and, and Miles, what is that one percent? Where, where is that one percent? One percent. If only it was one percent. Sorry, that's, point. that's the that's the carbon dioxide at the moment that we re-inject back into the Earth's crust as right. a fraction of the carbon we dig up, of the carbon dioxide we generate from the carbon we dig up in the form of oil, coal, and natural gas. And I, you so, know, I guess what, I, what I'm asking, Miles, is can you? And maybe this is a pun on words. Can you concretize that for people? Uh, a lot of it's happening in the US, actually. This is carbon dioxide from a power station, from a power plant or from a factory or something. You compress it to pressures where it forms a liquid and you re-inject it back underground. And if you re-inject it in the right place, it stays there. And this is actually used. The reason the 0.1% is being put back underground is actually primarily nothing to do with the environment. It's uh, it's because it's quite it's used um, to flush out oil in enhanced oil recovery. But but it, it you know it, it's it's happening, which is a good thing. But and so the technology is there. We know exactly how to do it. But it needs to be scaled up a thousandfold. And, and that's what's not happening at the moment. And the reason this is particularly important for the real estate in industry is it opens options for the real estate industry. Now, another option, which may not be the right option everywhere, but almost certainly would be a better option for many parts of the UK and certainly many parts of the US, would be to decarbonize gas. Uh, by gas, I mean, of course, I'm using the UK natural gas, um, uh, home heating gas, decarbonize gas upstream. So either take this carbon dioxide out of the gas as it comes out from under the North Sea and pipe hydrogen to houses. So you don't need to put in heat pumps. You can They can burn hydrogen in the home or even go one step further and capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, re-inject it underground and pipe natural gas to the, to the houses so that you're, you're balancing the carbon dioxide. It doesn't have to be the same carbon dioxide. Nobody cares if one yeah. ton of carbon dioxide is the same as any other one, but you've just got to balance it. Let's talk about carbon offsets, right? Which is today, I think, kind of become the crutch that the real estate industry has relied on as a pathway to get to net zero. What's your view of carbon offsets as a viable long-term instrument for the real estate industry to achieve net zero? So there's one kind of offsetting, which is absolutely fine if you bury CO2 or pay somebody else to bury CO2 equivalent to the CO2 generated by your activities. It's then non, it's non if you like. Mm -hmm. fact, it's non-atmospheric. I mean, that, that's, I mean, if they capture, they could capture that CO2 from the atmosphere and then bury it, and then you can generate CO2 yourself. And that would be, a, I guess, a form of offsetting. And this kind of offsetting works fine because it ensures that fossil CO2 is refossilized after it's, it may have moved through the atmosphere, get, but it gets put back where it came from, back underground. And where, so, so at, at the one extreme, that is a, a completely viable, completely sustainable offsetting 
proposition. It's not the way most people approach offsetting right now. Um, it is available, by the way, if you want to pay somebody to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and re-inject it back underground, you can do it. This is much more expensive than the kind of offsets that are on offer at the moment, which primarily consist of two things. Either paying people to emit less than they said they would have done if you hadn't paid them. And that is probably the most problematic form of offsetting, because now that the whole world has collectively decided in the Paris Agreement that we're all aiming for net zero, it sort of suddenly no longer really makes sense to claim that helping somebody else to reduce their emissions is somehow compensating for your emissions, because they've all committed to net zero anyway. So everybody should be reducing their emissions regardless. The other broad basket are where you're paying somebody to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but to do it using nature, using forests or, or ecosystem restoration or something to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, there are huge advantages to doing this. And there's a lot of excitement around these so-called nature-based solutions at the moment, um, because we need to restore our biosphere. We, we've, we've degraded the carbon content of the biosphere very badly over the past century. We need to put it back. So that's a that should be a priority. And funds in nature-based solutions can also deliver lots of benefits to wildlife, to biodiversity, and so on as well. So they're an absolutely essential part of the puzzle now, but it's also absolutely essential for everybody to be honest that that can't last for, for more than a, a decade or two. You can't turn rocks into trees forever. And if I put it that way, it should be pretty obvious to people that that's true. Okay, so, so the idea that you can burn fossil fuels and compensate for that activity by planting trees, that's, that's got to be a temporary solution. So any company that's using nature-based offsets today should have a plan for how they're going to transition to geological offsets, to putting carbon dioxide back underground within a couple of decades, I would argue. I like the way you put that. We're burning fossils, putting CO2 into the environment. And kind of one way of balancing the budget, which was kind of the first order thing you mentioned, is a private market transaction, which is that, you know, I say, okay, I, I'm more productive than you, Miles. Therefore, I'm going to buy, you know, I'm going to pay you a, a sum not to pollute. So because I'm higher, I, I generate more profit. I, I can effectively execute that private transaction. Your view is, in the end, that's a short-term solution that kind of bridge to nowhere. And the private market won't truly internalize all of that cost on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Then secondly is the kind of uh, ecological bridge of, okay, we're going to burn fossil fuels, but we're just going to reforest and we're going to kind of restore our, our biosystems to, to kind of a, a, a normalized level. But it just doesn't make sense, right? There's, there's too much earth and, and too little like soft tissue. It, it doesn't make sense in the long term. It makes huge long. amounts of sense in the short term. That's why it's a little bit of a difficult conversation, this one, because right. I don't want to discourage anyone from investing in the biosphere. You know, please don't don't, don't stop invest. We need to invest in the biosphere. We we desperately need to invest in in halting the decline in biodiversity on the planet and all, all for all sorts of reasons. But we've just got to be realistic about what it can deliver in the long term. You know, we, we published a paper of just a few weeks ago pointing out that even the most optimistic estimates of nature-based climate solutions carbon uptake might shave a tenth of a degree off global temperatures by mid-century. Now, fossil fuel emissions are driving up global temperatures by two tenths of a degree per decade. So that puts it into perspective. It's, it's useful, but it's only a few years of fossil fuel emissions. We have to stop fossil fuels themselves from causing global warming, and that will make them more expensive. So we will use less of them. Eventually, we'll stop using them because we'll move on and use something else. But you know, in the meantime, we have to, you know, we can't afford to wait for the world to stop using fossil fuels. We've got to stop global warming first. Today, the average building, even with the best retrofitting technology and the best energy efficiency technology, still only reduces about half of its operational carbon footprint. And so you'd expect, correspondingly, the real estate industry to be investing an enormous amount in the R&D to close the rest of that gap, but they're not. And I guess, what are the best paradigms you've seen to encourage private sector, in this case, the real estate industry, to invest in the R&D and the science that can actually close that gap? I, I mean, my, my feeling is that is that regulation works in the sense that companies will do anything to stay in business. So if they know that it's a licensing requirement, to keep doing what they do, to do X, then they just do X. I mean, it was revealing when I was, you know, again, sort of going back to the sequestration thing, when I, 
I was talking to a, an oil and gas company about our prospects for meeting the 1.5 degree goal. And somebody asked me, do you think there's any chance of us doing it? And I said, well, if you had to decarbonize your product, you know, get rid of one ton of CO2 for every ton generated by the oil and gas you sell, by 2050, would you be able to do it? And they just said, yeah, of course you would. If we had to, we'd just do it. I mean, they, they absolutely would. And so I believe if the real estate industry had to decarbonize our building stock, it would do it. Of course, it would make real estate more expensive. And, there's, and that's you know, simply doing it by fiat um, is probably not going to be the most effective way of doing it. But you know, setting progressive standards, I think, can work. And bringing the fossil fuel industry into this conversation as well, I think, is really important. At the moment, we tend to, you know, there tends to be a separation of that. People just decide, I'm going to use this type of fuel, electricity or gas or whatever, to, to heat my building or to power my building. And then that's it. There's the, that's, that's decisions made. And then they sort of work out how to use as little as possible of it and so on. But what, you know, eventually we're going to have to have... Uh, real estate operators engaging with their energy suppliers to make sh- to to maximize the carbon benefits of balancing the demands of the building with the the uh, the, the supplier. So, for example, if you, you know if electricity supply is dominated by renewables, it's expected to be much more intermittent. Our building stock, you know, we're, we're all worried about batteries at the moment. Our building stock is kind of a giant battery. It, it sort of cushions the, the energy content of a building in just in its in, in in the heat in its walls is an energy cushion which could be used exactly you know to 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 actually provide some capacitance into a renewables dominated energy mix but i'm not sure those kind of questions are those kind of discussions are happening people are just thinking well you know i'll have electricity i'll, I'll turn the switch on and so that's why i think we need we need smart regulation which drives um sectors together vertically so that people think about the full chain of, you know, from the point where the carbon comes in to the point where the building is nice and warm and you or, see or cool in the summer. I'm in Manhattan right now and I'm looking out and like, there's not solar on any of these roofs. But just to be clear, Why not? The, the tar is absorbing would-be energy that could have otherwise powered the building. And there is, it's almost like the real estate industry is this kind of culprit that has been hiding in plain sight. But in some ways we we can then therefore rely on our intuitions that it is one of the very obvious solves to this problem if we think about it at a very basic level which is that every building should effectively be its own power plant right yeah. like we should miniaturize the concept of power production at the asset level at the home level at every entity at every physical instantiation of you know human society should be its own power plant so it's, it, 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 it's an interesting dynamic and it changes the yeah it's, it's, it's interesting dynamic, but it changes a lot of the way you think about things a lot of the way you think about a building you know uh, we're we're used to sort of learning how to operate our iPhones and so on, but but we we think of buildings in a in a much more sort of medieval way. 